Chapter 1 London, Spring 1890 There were several reasons why I fell in love with Eddie Hardacre. But seeing a painter put the finishing touches to E. Hardacre, watchmaker, on the shop front that had been in my family's hands for over a century, I couldn't remember any of them. My former fiancé was worse than a pirate. At least pirates were loyal to their crew. Loyalty was a bartering tool Eddie employed whenever he needed to gain someone's trust. Someone like my poor, foolish, dead father. And me. It was time to tell Eddie what I thought of him. I'd kept my anger bottled inside for long enough, and if I didn't let it out, I would never heal. Besides, now was the perfect time as a customer inspected one of father's watches. Eddie loathed public displays of emotion. I would give him the most public of emotional displays that I could. I tugged on my jacket lapels, threw back my shoulders and marched past the gentleman's shiny black coach and into the shop that should have been mine. The entrance was as far as I got. The familiarity of my surroundings pinched my heart. The rich scent of polished wood mingled with the subtle tang of metal. The myriad tick-tocks, which irritated so many customers after mere minutes inside, summoned a well of memories. The individual rhythms sounded chaotic when placed in one room together, but they reassured me that all would be well, that I had come home. It had been two weeks since I'd heard their song. Two weeks since I'd stepped inside the shop. Two weeks since father died. It was time. Nothing had changed inside. The countertop stretched across the back, as sleek as ever. Behind it, the door to the workshop was closed. I recognised every clock hanging on the walls and set out on the tables, and all the glass display cabinets seemed to be filled with the same watches, from the inexpensive open face variety to those with elaborately designed silver cases known as hunters. Even father's ancient tortoiseshell and ormolu still ticked to its unique rhythm, but no one had bothered to correct it. It was three minutes slow. I'll be with you in a moment, Eddie said without looking up from the watch he was showing the gentleman. Such poor shopkeeping. One should always make eye contact with every customer. A warm smile and a pleasant greeting never went amiss either. I was, however, glad that he hadn't seen me immediately. Excuse me, sir. I addressed the back of the customer's dark head. He did not turn around, but I didn't let that stop me. Excuse me, sir, but unless you wish to finance a liar and swindler, you should not purchase a thing from this man. Eddie glanced up with a gasp. The colour leached from his face. India! He spluttered a hasty, excuse me, to his customer and rounded the counter. Arm out to usher me to the door, the colour flooded his face as quickly as it had left it. How lovely of you to visit me here, but as you can see, I'm rather busy. I'll call on you later, my dear. I ducked beneath his arm turned so that I could keep him in my sight and back toward the counter. I wanted to see Eddie's face turn ruby red as I informed his customer of his despicable behaviour. I am not your dear anymore, and I cannot believe that I ever wanted to be. I used to consider him handsome, with his blonde curls and blue eyes, and I'd once thought myself fortunate that he'd chosen me as his bride. My gratitude had been smashed to pieces along with my future two weeks ago. Now I thought him one of the ugliest men I'd ever seen. India! He lunged for me, but I was ready for him and stepped behind the table holding the collection of small mantel clocks. Come here at once! When I didn't, he stomped his foot on the floor like a spoiled child not getting his way. I gave him a tight-lipped smile. If you want me to leave... You will have to catch me first. He glanced past me to the gentleman who must have been quite stunned by my shocking behaviour. I didn't care what he thought. I'd always been known as the prim and proper daughter of Elliot Steele, 
but recent events had changed me. Let the dusty old men gossip about me at the guild's dining table. It no longer mattered, since I was not connected to the guild through father or the shop anymore. Eddie suddenly dodged to the left. I swerved and moved farther around the table. He growled in frustration. I laughed and inched closer, daring him to try again. Part of me wanted him to catch me, so that I could force him to act like the overbearing brute I knew him to be in front of a customer. You're making a scene, Eddie hissed. Good. He licked his lips, and his gaze flicked to the gentleman behind me again. He cleared his throat and squared his shoulders, attempting to look as if he were in control. Come now, India, be a good girl and leave this gentleman in peace. He doesn't wish to witness your hysterics. I'm a little too old to be called a girl, Eddie, don't you think? Quite, he said, his tone grating. Twenty-seven is definitely past the flush of youth. He might as well have announced that I was too old to wed. I was surprised he hadn't used it as an excuse to end our engagement. But then again, he'd known my age before he proposed. Nor am I hysterical, I added. Eddie smiled. It was all twisted cruelty. I braced myself for his next words. India and I were once engaged, he said to the gentleman who had remained silent behind me. Alas, her rather fanciful and forthright nature only became evident after our betrothal. I suppose I ought to be thankful that she didn't hide her true self until after it was too late. His laugh was as insipid as his pale blue eyes. I had to end our engagement or risk our children becoming afflicted. You ended our engagement because you got what you wanted, and what you wanted wasn't me, it was father's shop. I only just heard the gentleman behind me clear his throat over the pounding of blood between my ears. Eddie must have heard it too, and he collected himself. He licked his lips again, a habit that I now despised. Sir, I do apologise. Eddie bobbed his head in imitation of the little automated bird that emerged on the hour from the cuckoo clocks. He looked as ridiculous as he was pathetic. India, he snapped at me. Leave, now. I thrust my hand on my hip, smiled and spun round to speak to the gentleman and make an even bigger scene. An extremely tanned man with dark brown eyes, striking cheekbones and thick lashes stood there. If it weren't for his scowl and the signs of exhaustion around his mouth and eyes, he would be handsome. He was everything Eddie was not tall and dark and broad across the shoulders. He wore a well-tailored black suit, untroubled by his impressive frame, a silk hat and a grey silk tie. While his clothing screamed gentlemen, his stance did not. He leaned one elbow on the counter as if he were half drunk and needed propping up. A gentleman would have straightened in the presence of a woman, but this man didn't. Perhaps he wasn't English, the deep tan would suggest not. It took me a moment to remember what I'd been about to say, and in that moment he spoke first. I have business to conduct with Mr. Hardacre, he said in a flawed, upper-class English accent. It was plummy enough, but the crispness had been sliced off and replaced by a slight drawl. Please take your argument with you when you leave. He held his hand out, showing me the door. I remembered what I wanted to say all of a sudden. Mr Hardacre is a liar and a scoundrel. Eddie made a strangled, choking sound. So you already pointed out, the customer said. He sounded bored, but that could have been a result of his accent. Is that the man you want to give your custom to? I pressed. At the present time, yes. Eddie chuckled. My hand slid off my hip and fisted at my side. I swallowed down the sense of hopelessness that threatened to overwhelm me. My scheme to discredit Eddie was quickly unravelling before my eyes. 
then you're aiding and abetting a man with the morals of a rat. He doesn't care who he ruins to get what he wants, only that he gets it in the end, by whatever means necessary. I heard how pathetic and desperate I sounded, yet I couldn't stop the words from spilling forth anyway. I was tired of holding them in, of smiling and telling acquaintances that I would be all right. I wasn't all right. I was pathetic and desperate. I had no employment, no money and no home. I'd lost my fiancé and my father within days of one another, although I'd never really had a fiancé as it turned out. Our engagement had been a ruse, a way to get father to sign over the shop to Eddie. I am sorry, miss, the gentleman said, sounding genuinely sympathetic. I'm sure you are now. Eddie is no better than the muck on your boots. He sighed, and the tiny lines at the corners of his eyes deepened. No, I mean I'm sorry for doing this. Two long strides brought him to me so that I got to admire his impressive height and frame. But not for long. Two large hands clamped around my waist, lifted me and tossed me over one of those brawny shoulders I'd been admiring. What are you doing? I cried. This is outrageous. Let me down at once. He did not. With one arm clamped over the backs of my thighs, he strode to the door as if I were nothing more than a sack of flour. The blood rushed to my head. My hat hung by its pins. I pounded his back with my fists, but it had no effect. I was utterly helpless, and I did not like being so, one little bit. Behind me, Eddie roared with laughter. I felt the gentleman's muscles tense and heard a sharp intake of breath. He didn't slow, however, but merely pushed open the door and deposited me on the pavement. I stumbled and he clasped my shoulders until I regained my balance. Then he let me go. My apologies, miss, he said with a curt nod. But your conversation was taking too long and I'm a busy man. I fixed my hat and straightened my spine, mustering as much dignity as I could. It wasn't easy with all the shopkeepers and their customers looking out of doors and windows to see what had caused the commotion. I don't care. To my horror, my voice cracked. I did not want to cry. Not any more. I'd shed enough tears over Eddie and the things I'd lost. I don't care if I make you late for an appointment or if I lost Eddie your custom. You are a brute, a fiend. You may look like a gentleman, but you most certainly are not one. Cyclops, the man said to someone over my shoulder. I glanced around to see a giant figure with a black patch over one eye jump nimbly down from the coachman's perch and advance on me. I swallowed a scream and shrank away, but he caught my arm. I tried to pull free, but he caught my other arm and his grip tightened. The red, lumpy scar dripping from beneath his patch stood out against his charcoal skin, the white of his teeth even more so as he bared them in a snarl. Let me go, I screamed, pulling harder. Mr. Macclefield, help! Mr. Macclefield, the neighbouring tailor, took one look at the giant and fled back inside the shop. Up and down the street, shopkeepers shut their doors. Folk I'd known my entire life cowered inside. Even the painter went very still on the top of his ladder, as if he hoped no one would notice him there. No one came to my rescue. I'd never felt more alone or so vulnerable. I glanced up at the giant who held both my wrists and blinked back hot tears. Please let me go. I whispered. Can't miss, he said in a booming voice with an accent similar to the gentleman's, but from the gutters rather than the townhouse. You just stay out here with me and let Mr. Glass finish his chat. I sniffed. So you won't let me go, even if I promise not to go back inside? He shook his head. I won't be long, the gentleman behind me said. I see. I drew in a breath, let it out, and stomped my heel into the giant's boot. He winced, and his one eye widened, but he didn't let me go. The gentleman laughed softly. 
Good shot. The giant grunted. Not bad for a little thing. I ought to have been frightened witless, but their light-hearted banter quelled my fear. Not that I felt safe and confident, but I no longer felt like the giant or his master wanted to hurt me. Sir, if you please, Eddie said in a sickeningly sycophantic tone, we'll finalise our business inside. I need to ask you some questions first, the gentleman Mr Glass said. Questions? About the watch? Of course. Sir, I said over my shoulder, I had only moments in which to ruin this for Eddie, as he'd ruined so much more for me. Mason and Sons have a finer hunter minute repeater than the one you were admiring in there. I couldn't bring myself to call it hardacre watchmakers. It was steel watchmakers to me and always would be. If you want my advice, you ought to spend your money at that establishment. Not only will you get excellent service, but you'll be supporting an upstanding family. India! Eddie shouted. If you don't calm down, I'll send for a constable. He clicked his fingers at Jimmy, the boy who occasionally ran errands for the shopkeepers in the street. He was the only one who'd not retreated indoors, but that would be because Jimmy wasn't allowed in the shops. None of the shopkeepers trusted him not to steal from them. None since father had died and Eddie had evicted me, that is. He strolled over, hands thrust deep into his pockets, but hung back, clearly not willing to take Eddie's side, but unable to do anything to help me. I've already been to Mason and Sons, Mr Glass said to me, ignoring Eddie. There was nothing to interest me there. I wish to look at this watch. Come, sir, Eddie said, grasping Mr Glass's arm. Mr Glass narrowed his gaze at him, and Eddie let go with a loud swallow. I'll give you a good price on the watch. You cannot have been to Mason and Sons, I said to the gentleman. Mr. Mason truly does have a finer example of the same timepiece. I saw it late yesterday, and I doubt he has sold it already. Mr. Glass turned a curious expression toward me. Where before he'd looked tired, he was now alert. It was as if he'd just realised something of monumental importance to him, and it involved me. His gaze focused on mine with fierce, driving intensity, it was an unnerving experience to be the object of it, more so than the physical presence of his coachman. If I weren't restrained, I would have left and been glad to have escaped. From what, I didn't know. You're familiar with Mr. Mason and his work? He asked me. I am. He was both a friend and rival of my father's. Their relationship had been a complicated one, while they respected and liked one another, they had to compete for customers among London's elite. Fortunately, there were enough wealthy in the city to keep them and several other watch and clock makers in business. Mr Mason had been the first person I'd gone to after Eddie had ended our engagement, but he'd not been able to employ me with three sons and a daughter of his own. Mr Glass closed his eyes and rubbed his forehead as if trying to remove an ache. It was so odd, coming after his intense glare, that I checked with his servant to see if he thought it out of character. The coachman frowned at his master. Matt, he called his master by his first name. What a peculiar arrangement. Uh, sir, you need to... I'm fine, Mr Glass snapped. Don't bloody look fine, the coachman muttered, sounding a little hurt. Your father is a watchmaker? Mr. Glass asked me, lowering his hand. He patted his coat as if feeling for something in the pocket. Perhaps it was snuff or a pipe that he wished to smoke to return the colour to his cheeks. He looked quite peaky. Was. I spread my hands to indicate the shop windows with the watches set out on the lower shelf and the higher shelves filled with clocks of all shapes and sizes. He owned this establishment under the name Steele until his death two weeks ago. I swallowed the lump rising up my throat, but the tears welled nevertheless. He left it to me in his will, Eddie cut in quickly. 
because you assured him that you would keep your promise to marry me and my fool of a father believed you. I believed you. I choked out. I no longer cared what the gentleman or his servant thought of my behaviour. Two weeks ago I'd been too sad and shocked to tell Eddie what I thought of him, but not any more. I was still sad, but those two weeks had given me time to think. I wasn't shocked now. I was mad. I wasn't to know then that you were such a strong-willed creature, Eddie said. If I had, I wouldn't have asked for your hand. Take this display, for example. One doesn't need further evidence of your willfulness. Rage surged through my body. I felt like I was burning with it from the inside out. What I am is the daughter and assistant of Elliot Steele, watchmaker. No, that is what you were. Now you're just pathetic. Go away, India. Nobody wants you here. I gritted my teeth and pulled myself free from the man holding me. To my surprise, he let go. I barged up to Eddie and slapped him across the cheek before he saw my hand coming. Eddie reeled back, clutching the side of his face. He stared open-mouthed at me, his expression caught between fear and shock, as if I were a ghastly and strange creature. I suppose in some ways I was. I certainly didn't feel like myself at that moment. I felt lighter, liberated, and yes, very strange indeed. Mr Glass cleared his throat. Miss Steele. I smiled at him and his one-eyed servant. The coachman grinned back. Yes, Mr Glass, I said. Would you mind joining me this afternoon in the tea room at Brown's Hotel? Me? My smile slipped off. I stared at him. But why? Yes, Eddie muttered. Why her? Mr Glass ignored him. To discuss your father. I was trying to decide if it was unseemly to drink tea alone with a strange gentleman in a salubrious hotel, and if I cared about that sort of thing any more, when Eddie took advantage of my silence. I can tell you everything you wish to know about Elliot Steele. I knew him well. Oh, do shut up, Eddie. It seemed I'd thought of something to say after all. I will join you for tea, Mr Glass. Thank you. The brown eyes briefly flared, and a small smile touched his lips. It quickly vanished, however, and his jaw went rigid. The muscle bunched and did not release. It was as if he was bearing down against a pain. Unease ate at my gut. I didn't know this man, and he had a rather frightening-looking servant, yet I'd agreed to drink tea with him. It would seem today was a day to do things that were out of character for me. I pushed my unease aside. We can discuss watches, I said to Mr Glass, simply to see Eddie's face turn red with anger again. If it's a hunter minute repeater you're after, then there are many fine examples in the city, much finer than here. They were your father's timepieces, Eddie cried. That watch is exquisite. The regulator pin sticks and it loses five seconds every twelve hours. I was never able to fix it. You mean your father couldn't, Eddie said smugly. No, I mean I couldn't. I've been doing all the repair work for three years, ever since father's sight deteriorated. Well then, now it's my turn to repair them. Elliot left me all his notes. They're three years out of date. My notes were not part of the inheritance. I spun on my heel, gave a nod to Mr Glass and another to his servant and said, Shall we say three o'clock? Perfect, Mr Glass said, with a smile that momentarily banished the tiredness from his eyes. See you then. I walked up the street, feeling as if the entire city watched me. I turned the corner and doubled back, just in time to see Mr Glass being driven away. He removed his gloves and studied something in his hand. He closed his fingers around it, tipped his head back and breathed deeply, as if he were finally getting the rest he craved. It wasn't this behaviour that set my pulse racing, however, it was the object in his fisted hand and the bright purplish glow it emitted, a glow that infused his skin and disappeared up his sleeve.' 